Okay, awesome. I now have Fabio back again. Welcome back, Fabio. Thank you. That's also why we switched to English. Um, <laughs> and we got Alexander. Yes. Thanks. You guys had a talk about stealthy persistent techniques. Tell me about it. Yeah. What do you do? So we showed uh, two techniques. Well, we briefly talked about, you know, how all different ways of possibly gaining persistence, so uh -huh. maintaining access, right, to an environment. Uh, and we showed two quick demos about some techniques that were demos. a little bit more stealthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we did two demos in 20 minutes, which was a bit of a, you know, we had to go yeah. pretty quick, but I think we delivered the point, I hope. Yeah. What, Alex, uh, what did you do? Uh, so I talked about uh, com handler persistence. Okay. Um, so it's a tricky way to edit a um, uh, or hijack a uh, legitimate uh, scheduled task. Oh. So you can use uh, the com registry to uh, yeah run the wrong thing kind of when you so you uh, running the legitimate task. So you could kind of if it was a possibility to have like a normal time. Do you do you need to rewrite it or can you use any kind of payload? Do you need to do uh, like um, side channel DLL loading or or can you change the whole name of the yeah. task like the the the. Um, the arbitrary file that it runs. Yeah, you can you can do both. Uh, so if both. there's <laughs> <laughs> so one one yeah normal way to do it would be so in the com registry you have like CLS IDs and under them you have uh, sub keys. So you can have a local server, which is what I showed. Mm. So you have local server and then you have local server 32. Mm. And local server 32 has precedence over local server. So if the legitimate task is configured with a local server, you can hijack it and run your own thing if you just add a 32 uh, variant of it. Uh, so that's one way. But the, the way I showed on stage now is a uh, you just change the actual ID and then you create your own um, yeah, comma objects that Sneaky. you reference. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's the way to go. What did you, what did you, uh, what did you do, Fabio? I showed how uh, to use the golden semol attack. Mm. Uh, so ADFS? ADFS, yes. So basically, uh, you know, federated apps, when they trust, uh, well, Azure AD, mm. or they might trust Act Azure Active Directory, which in turn trusts mm. uh, the ADFS uh, on-prem. <coughs> uh, this is actually what they used in the SolarWinds campaign as a second mm. stage in their in their attack uh, for some of the targets that they deemed interesting, mm -hmm. then they took uh, they compromised the ADFS server in the on-premise environment. They extracted the signing keys, and they used those to forge their own tickets. And then they can impersonate anyone and access any federated application straight to the internet. Uh, <sighs> and that completely bypassed the authentication because you don't go to ADFS anymore. You are ADFS. You just oh. create your own tickets. Which is pretty nasty. But I love it. As somebody that works with offensive, this is the, the things that I kind of love. Yeah. yeah. A, a very strong, and we had that conversation earlier where I talked to both, like, last fucking uh, sign talked about it, the importance of having, like, a federated login so you don't pass the, the identification. The, the, mm. You can, if you can't leak your credentials, uh, then you, you, you kind of can't. Uh, steal the, the username and password. Yeah, but I mean, in this scenario, you compromise <laughs> the only system that is supposed to... Be trusted. Because, you know, the apps trust Azure AD, Azure AD trusts the ADFS server, mm. and then trust Active Directory on-prem, right? That's kind of the flow. So if you take over Active Directory, then, of course, that's step number one. If you go one step, you know, follow the chain, then you have ADFS that is supposed to... Uh, accept that authentication attempt for yeah. what you to AD in the back end and then verify and send it back. If you, you know, the problem really here is that someone got access to ADFS. Uh, it's scary though. And, and just to help me understand this, what would be the m mitigation to, to protect against this? It's yeah. So when you get that type of high level of access, it's basically equivalent <laughs> to a domain controller access, yes. right? So it's really hard. They already came way too far. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so, I mean, step number one is consider the ADFS in the same tier as a domain controller because mm -hmm. it is, uh, you know, obviously. Um, you actually can, uh, if you want to prevent the key from being extracted, the mm -hmm. signing key yeah. uh, that, for, that signs tickets, if mm -hmm. you want, that to be protected, you can use an HSM, a hardware security module on the actual EFS server. So, so you can't extract the key and bring it away with you. Mm. Uh, 
but still, you are on the ADFS server, so you can still hijack the authentication on the ADFS server itself. Yep. But that requires that you actually run stuff uh, on the ADFS server for your persistence. If you can take the key, it's nicer for a threat actor because you don't need to have on-prem persistence anymore. You just need that key, and then you run away, and you can use it to just outside directly and target the applications. Uh, but you can protect the key. Yeah, I love and that. And then also, um, when you have a situation where you think it might have been extracted, mm. remember to reset the private key, uh, just as you do a like you know. Is it tricky? I've well, never tried it with uh, someone else. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it's gonna be tricky. Uh, because it's a, just make sure you reset you know it, it, and then it's like, okay, you have, need to rebuild the whole Active Directory. Yeah, but it depends on the other provider, because okay. you can change the key. But if, uh, uh, let's say, if Azure AD doesn't know that your ADFS has changed key, it's not going to trust the new tickets. Ah. And it's still going to trust the old ones that the threat actor has key for. Yeah. Uh, so you need to make sure that all the providers are also aware of the change. Mm. So revoke? Uh, well, you change. You change the public certificate or or your ADFS. You mm. change the metadata of the certificate mm. uh, of the ADFS. Uh, I believe that's how we do. I haven't done it myself either. No problem. Uh, you know, but, you but, know, but, uh, that's why we have the Yeah, right. no, but <laughs> that's what needs to be done anyway. The key yeah. needs to be changed. Some stuff is probably going to break, and then it needs to be fixed. That's how it usually goes when you need to do like reset of pretty central stuff. Pretty sweet. Now we've been a bit technical, and it's time for that part of this uh, uh, the show where we have a friendly little bit of a competition because the chat, my friendly and amazing people in the chat, needs to have a way to win the awesome TrueSec swag that we have, and it's it could be, it, it is a secret swag box, and it contain, it could contain a nice TrueSec thing. Uh, I definitely know it's going to contain a thermos because that's been ordered and not delivered. So it's going to be really, really <laughs> nice. Uh, and then you also have a chance, a, a secret Santa, maybe you'll get a pair of these nice stuck glasses. That's going to happen. But to be able to win this, we need to have a friendly competition. And Fabio, since you were here last time, uh, you, have the, you, you competed in either... Um, Labyrinthen, tic-tac-toe, or, uh, or shuffleboard. So, um, do you know Max did pass you? He had <gasps> Max currently has six in shuffleboard. So, it's no. Very okay. You know, my competitive side is taking over now. I have to do that again and beat the six. So we're doing. We're doing shuffleboard. We're doing shuffleboard. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, same procedure as last year, but you didn't see it, Alex. So what? It, since you're a quite tall person, person, uh, I want you to. Get down a little bit here because we're gonna have right. our friends, the chat and the audience over there. So you need to crouch down a bit, otherwise we'll be just waist down shot and that's gonna <laughs> be boring. So and what you need to do is just to send it over there and hopefully it will stay in this area or it will run out. Currently, Max is at the lead with six points. Right. Fabio used to be in the lead with four, so you're up for good measurement. Who uh, who starts is being chosen by uh, Rochambeau, which is the Sax Pause. And you do one, two, three, and whoever wins gets to choose if they start or if they don't start. So okay. here you go. Go. Okay, again. Okay, so who starts you then? I you choose. Uh, you yeah. start then. Okay. Ah, smart choice now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, before we begin, before we begin, yeah. chat, make sure that you vote for who's going to be the one that plays A for Alexander or F for Fabio. And we will not begin until we get some of those results in. F for Fabio, A for Alexander. Here we go. Too strong. Uh, yeah. Ah, too strong. Good arm there, a little bit. Okay, he's going slower. That seems like it can stop. Oh, oh no. so close. Now, gracefully, he's going to end up with a three-pointer here. Ah! Oh. You have too much power. Uh, Zero point, <laughs> but all power. good. Uh, <laughs> you too don't, don't feel to be, uh, no. you don't have to be too ashamed of that. Uh, Hassan also has zero. That's so. good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> It's all good. All right. <laughs> Fabio, you've done this before, so you got one leg up. Yeah. But you need to beat six to beat Max. Oh, looks good. Okay. So one. Hard, easy. Two threes now. Second one looks good. Oh. oh, it's not even forward. Okay. You have officially now beat Alex, though. Well, well. Yeah. Okay, okay, but. Congrats. <laughs> Fabio is the winner. Perfect. Thank you, Fabio. But you had a 
You well, kind of know what you beat, score. Uh, We're not keeping the scores because if you... I'm still going to say you had four. So that's going to be yeah, the thing that's that we're going mine. for. That's still mine. So uh, we're going to head directly over to, to Bjorn. Bjorn, do we have any inter interesting questions within the chat? Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yeah. Um, we are going with the same questions uh, that we actually had for um, Hassan and David. Oh. So, and this is... Uh, because you talked about the, the this. So so um the question is if you introduce a tiered structure in your environment and with the the thing you talked about, how big a problem is it uh, with all the traces left on various servers in case of incorrect or poor use? So how are you guys uh, af affected with old logins of domain admins and stuff? Or have they already bypassed all of that with the uh, ADFS? Just so I understand the question correctly, is it like in a scenario where there is tiering in place? Well, if if you as a, uh, an IT admin uh, put in tiered the tiering in your environment, mm. uh, is that still a problem for you guys? Uh, with for us? Yeah. Well, for for who? Like for, for we, we, we wear different hats mm. depending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, if we can't come from from this session that you talked about today. All right, so yeah. creating persistence or yeah. identifying persistence? Because I guess we talked about both. I think, <laughs> yeah, okay. Then it's your choice. Well, let's take both then. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, so, how does tiering affect creating persistence and how does it affect identifying persistence? Mm -hmm. I think identifying actually probably doesn't really matter because you have full access when, mm -hmm. or you're supposed to be able to have full access when I you mean, do it investigation. It, yeah. But it can. It can reduce the scope, right? So, like, if we know that they didn't uh, take tier zero, mm. then like there's some kind of persistence that you don't have to look for, mm. but you, you should still look for it. But like, yeah, you get the point. Yeah, like and you and can limit, like, if you know what they had. Th right. It actually helps structuring the investigation yeah. maybe better because then you can, uh, like you said, you have a more defined mm. scope of the tier that you know is affected, and then you can, ver like, you can try to identify whether the other tier has also been compromised. And if you do, then you know you have a bunch of other systems uh, that also are potentially affected. Mm. That is if the tiering is done right. <laughs> and uh, we learned that we never need to assume anything like that. Uh, never. So <laughs> we will yeah. still check everything. Uh, when it comes to, well, let's put it this way. We showed, you showed an example about, you know, having persistence on a compromised system. Mm. Uh, and, you know, obviously you are already there. So, I mean, in terms of modifying a task in a stealthy way or whichever other way you want to do it, that doesn't really matter how you logged into it, right? It might, like, the ways you have to get onto a system are reduced, hopefully, if tiering works. Mm. Uh, I think it's maybe more relevant in the demo that I did, uh, compromising the ADFS server and then use that to forge tickets. Because mm. uh, tiering needs to be in the same tier as the domain controller. Sorry, <laughs> ADFS needs to be in the same tier as the domain controller. As mentioned, uh, you have to limit to understand that the extreme capabilities that server has compared to. You right. Know, any so, other I mean, if you get that far, that yeah. you get on the on an ADFS server, then it doesn't weird. matter, right? You are there, you can still grab the key, you can still do the thing. Uh, like you're on a DC, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, in interesting. Um, I got a quick question, though. Both of you have worked in incident. You work in offensive security. And uh, when, you know, your talk was about the persistent techniques. If there's, Let's say that it's a brand new, fresh incident. You're getting in. It's not ransomware. Things haven't just been erased yet. Mm -hmm. But there's some something weird going on. Where do you guys start? How do you start to identify what goes on? Because environments can be really big. How yeah. do you begin? Where is it gut feeling, or is it just, oh, this is usually where it happens? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, mm. Because, by the way, those are the most fun type of cases, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Because uh, you actually have, you know, an ongoing thing to mm -hmm. to look for. Um, Hopefully, the threat actor is still active in the system, so you need to be stealthy and right. sneaky and on PTO. Yeah, out. and in any case, you don't know, right? They yep. might very well, so you still need to start sneaky. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> as in the sneaky incident responder. The sneaky there. incident responder. Uh, well, the thing is, I mean, you normally have something to start with, right? Yeah. That's how the whole incident started. Yes. So normally, following the trail yeah. is, is where you start. Mm. 
Uh, but you can also do, I and mean, you can use tooling, either like, you know, collection scripts or yeah. tools mm -hmm. or uh, EDR if it's already in place to do threat mm -hmm. hunting or maybe deploy an EDR. That might raise, you know, some attention, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a tool. It's, you know, an organization might just... Alex uh, really used a pretty uh, sweet tool when we were over at SecT, when we did the conference talk, when you and I talked about... Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ...on incident response and, and, and threat acting. And that tool was pretty sweet because it scanned through all the registry keys. So you will find the ones that were time-stamped or not. Yeah, yeah, it goes through the registry, right? And then you yeah. get the timestamps. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's uh, for uh, service persistence in particular. So it uh, services are like you can have like the actual uh, yeah, launch string that will run when the service runs, but there will also be like service DLL files that will mm -hmm. load when the service loads. So it takes like all of those different things um, and gets the different timestamps and creates a yeah, shiny timeline from that. Yeah. So you can like yeah, this at this point they like did something sketchy on the system and then you check the timeline mm. and see what happened around that time. Mm. So yeah, um, it helps both with that and also to like detect time stomping in particular. Yeah. So like if there's something that is like, doesn't really make sense. So the service was created here, but the, uh, yeah, something else happened later, but it should have happened before. And yeah, you, you get the point. We are soon heading into a break, but before we leave this, could you quickly just explain time stomping for somebody that doesn't understand what time, time stomping is? Yeah. So. Mm. You want to yeah. take it or should I take it? <laughs> yeah, sure. But so in the uh, Sena Windows uh, uh, NTFS file system, you have a few different timestamps. So from the user space, you have three timestamps. Mm -hmm. And you have the access time, you have the last modify time, and you have the creation time. And those times you can, like, super trivially, you can just set them to whatever. Oh. And uh, pretty much like take one file, uh, last write time UTC equals another file, last time UTC, and it will just override it. And it's that simple, really. Uh, so and that would be a stealthy, persistent technique because you're hiding the time of access. Yeah, exactly. So you're, so you're showing a different time uh, step. Yeah, but to take like for example, uh, say that you do a DLL side loading or yes. something, and then like you, the way you would detect it is maybe that you have uh, this, you know, I don't know, Chrome folder mm. uh, where Chrome was installed, but there's a DLL file that is new and everything else is old. Yeah. So that sticks out a bit, and someone might dig a bit deeper into that. But if that's time stomped, so that's created when everything else is created, then it doesn't stick out anymore. And it's, uh, yeah, in that kind of situation, it becomes really tricky. Um, actually, also, just to circle back to the thing about um, tiering, and yeah, uh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just to add that it makes our life so much easier to have that like hygiene and having tiering from the sense that, you know, one of the most popular, not advanced persistence technique that we see is just installing something like TeamViewer or, like, you know, Screen Connect or whatever type of, you know, legitimate solution. Yeah. And having your own, uh, like, hosted server and just connect back. And that is super easy to detect. I mean, it's in listed installed programs. Yeah. But if you have an environment where you have 50 legitimate remote access programs mm -hmm. and you have like no way of knowing what's legitimate and what's not legitimate, then it's all of a sudden it's impossible to find it. Yes. So having that like structure and hygiene and like this is how we log into systems and this is where we do it from and blah, blah, blah. We don't mm -hmm. have backdoors like we use ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Which Shadow IT. Yeah. That makes our life much, much easier. Um, here, here. Yes. <laughs> great. Okay, finally, before we head into the break, Bjorn, do we have any last quick questions? Uh, actually, no. Uh, just cheering and a uh, very good session. Okay, awesome. I'm awesome. very happy that you guys are here. Uh, we're now heading straight into yet another break.